<laughs> All right, y'all. So this is my friend Sherry. I think I told you the story of how we met. Yes. No. No. I don't it. no? Do you want to tell the story how we know each other? I was going to say, do you want the juicy version or the clean version? <laughs> no, the juicy version. Come on, I have a whole semester with them. They're used to the juicy version. No, Richard was the boyfriend of my oldest, uh, my first boyfriend. We shared a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so Towns was Towns was my first boyfriend when I was 14 years old. And uh you were a tiny bit older, right, Richard? Maybe uh, no, I think we're roughly the same age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then uh Richard came and stayed at my house in Brooklyn and his appendix burst. And he had me rush to the hospital over Christmas. It was terrible. It wasn't there. She was in Richmond visiting her mother. Which is where I am right now. It's so funny. It's like we always are. <laughs> yeah. It always comes full circle. Yeah, does no, it? I really thought I was going to die. Yeah. <laughs> I have a giant scar to prove it. Although I tell people it was from a knife fight in Buenos Aires. Like that's better stuff. <laughs> and I think he was taken to the very worst hospital in all of New York City. <laughs> so it's like... Not a lie. Kings County Hospitals where they take all the homeless, the drug addicts. And, and yeah, so the like... drug addicts and the gunshot victims and, and Richard. So <laughs> it was great. <laughs> That's the quality of Canisius Insurance, by the way. Uh, no, I literally thought I was going to die if I had to go over, if I had to go too far to the hospital. The deal. They might have just taken me into Manhattan. I'm like, I, I would die before we yeah. get there. Yeah. And, uh, and then she she kindly let me convalesce in her house once she got back. But also, it was Christmas, between Christmas and New Year. Yeah. Or where should I go? I need a gypsy cab. And like, she was like, at her mom's house. Why would she answer my text? Right? <laughs> no, we found it. Anyway, I survived. Uh, um, yes. Yeah, no. so and for the record, we're all still friends. Her, yes. Yes. Gibson, right. We're all friends. <laughs> Fantastic friends because we're all adults. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> It's like when you have somebody good in your life, you don't ever throw them away. That's my, it's like, just get through whatever you need to get through and don't lose the good people. That's my, that's my opinion about everything. Not to say that, have a little tear shed, right? When yeah. We broke up. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we broke up when I was with students in Virginia on a field trip for my plantation class. Really? So, I did not know that. As you may recall this, Sherry. You could you could come here, yes, for, and give a lecture. I, a lecture, yes. And I had said something about like, well, I just don't know what's happening with us. And I think you gave him a talking to, and you said you either you tell him what's going on. And, <laughs> or, In my family, we call it shit or get off the pot. <laughs> right, exactly. And he took a shit, and. My students were like, because I, you know, then he left, and and then my students were like, Richard, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's fine. Uh, but then now, you Davide, who's like the best. Right. So you know, there's always a happy ending. There's always but... a happy ending. Exactly. <laughs> so that's how I know Sherry, and. Um, <laughs> I've, I've taught a couple of her other novels as well, um, in particular, The Dress Lodger, so uh, historical fiction, um, which I recommend The Dress Lodger as well, uh, for those of you interested in um, women's empowerment issues and so forth. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, now as I know her, like, clearly. So, like, I talk to her enough. It's your chance to talk to her, and um, but maybe, sure, you want to uh, maybe do a little intro spiel and then we can ask some questions uh sure um so just sort of like circuitous route to becoming a novelist I was an actor I was a theater major in college and moved to New York to become a poet you know the lucrative field of being a poet and an actor and uh, started working as a temp in publishing when I wanted to write my first novel and uh, I took all the money I had in the world and I went uh for four months to Greece. And this would have been like 1991 or 1992. And I was like, I was going to write the great American novel. And I, I sat like under bushes and in naked caves and everything like scribbling down and writing a novel and got back to New York and um, 
uh, met with a literary agent who I was working for at the time. And she asked to read my, my book and I, I gave it to her and she took it home over the weekend and she came back and um, she held out the pages to me. And she was just like, no, 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 no. And it was terrible. It was the word. It was just like a, it was a it was a big fat mess. It was the first thing that I ever wrote. And so I put that novel in a drawer and I sat down and I, I got a full time job with this literary agent reading other people's novels. And that's basically how I taught myself how to write. So I read books that were really good. I read books that were really bad. I tried to learn from the books I thought were successful and avoid the mistakes of the books that didn't work. And uh, after about probably a year and a half of like having this full-time job and getting up at four o'clock in the morning and writing every day, I had um, my first published novel, which was called A Stolen Tongue. And it was about uh, a medieval monk on um, a pilgrimage in the 1480s, um, tracking the relics of St. Catherine of Alexandria. And so that was that book got published at, by Grove Atlantic and it was translated into 13 languages. And then I sat down and wrote my second novel, which was called The Dress Lodger, which was Richard referred to, that was about um, a prostitute and an anatomy student stealing bodies during the cholera epidemics in the 1830s. And then I wrote a third novel, and then I had three children. And then I, uh, one, of my, one of my sons, um, who was a twin, got really, really sick. And that's when I was writing Witches on the Road Tonight. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> hi. And so, um, so I had three children under two. I had no income. I was trying to write another book and I was, I was thinking a lot about fear. You know, my son had been diagnosed with cancer as a little baby. I was terrified all the time. I wasn't getting any kind of sleep. I was, um, this is during the first Gulf war. And so I turn on CNN and the, you know, CNN was trying to scare the shit out of us. And I started really thinking about fear and why we as a country were so determined to keep ourselves afraid. Like who was profiting by our fear and our paralysis? <laughs> and that's um, when I sat down and started writing Witches on the Road tonight. And it was originally conceived. I, I got your questions. Uh, Richard forwarded them to me and they're so fantastic. I can't wait to talk to you guys about it. But one of the questions is, you know, did, did did you start with one part and then kind of expand? And I did. I um I originally started with the part that takes place in the nineteen uh, in nineteen forty um, during the WPA period and a ginseng hunter, and um and so I was going to write another historical novel because my most successful book had been Dress Lodger and that was historical. And I was scared. I was scared to take a big risk. So I'm like, okay, let me go back to the thing that worked. So I was going to write this historical novel. And then my third novel, which was called The Mammoth Cheese, got um, nominated for this big award in England. And so they flew me and my husband out there. And I sat through a lecture on fear. And, and the most dangerous thing for a writer is to be afraid. And so I'd already been thinking about it. And so I went back and I took that little piece that was set in 1940 and I expanded it into two other parts and I made it the story of a family through different generations and how each one of them used fear as a kind of currency. First, you know, the Appalachian witch who takes her skin off and rides men at night. And then the Captain Casket who did, um, you know, uh, midnight horror movies in the 1970s. Like when I was a kid, I used to watch these. And then moving forward to CNN and how Wallace, the, the third in the generation, uses fear on a kind of a, a multinational broad level through 24-hour television. And now if I were writing it, I'd add another generation and I would make it all about social media and TikTok and and Twitter or X and Facebook and every other sort of way that, you know, misinformation is being used to stoke fear. It's all a form of witchcraft. It's a, it's a form of black magic, you know, that you could use for good or for evil. So that's, um, that's sort of my life as a novelist. And then I had three kids I had to support and put through college and people were buying fewer and fewer books. And I'm like, well, what else could I do to make money? And so I took Witches on the Road tonight and I um, I sat down and I adapted it to a television pilot. 
And luckily I was able to, because I was already a pretty successful novelist, I was able to cross over into writing for TV. And I went into a writer's room. I started off, I was 47 years old and I started off as a staff writer, like with a bunch of 20 year olds. And, um, and uh, I worked my way up through probably four or five different TV shows. And now I'm an executive producer on um, a show called Palm Royale, which I don't know if you guys have seen it. If you have Apple, if you have Apple TV, it's like the number one show on Apple right now. And couldn't be more different. Takes place in Palm Beach in 1969. It's kind of a dark, quirky comedy. And um, and then I'm a, working on adapting a friend's novel um, called The Kingdoms of Savannah, which is kind of a, a dark detective ghost story that takes place in Savannah, Georgia. And if that goes forward, like I'm writing the script for that, I would be the showrunner of that. So I've, you know, I've managed to make the transition and it's... Uh, you know, and along the way also helped to found an organization called The Moth, which I don't know if you guys know it, but it's it's a storytelling organization. And um, it's everything, like every part of my life, poetry, theater, novels, The Moth, TV, it's all about the art of storytelling. And I feel like if you can tell a good story, you know, you can do it in almost any form that you want to. Um, you have to be able to like support yourself. <laughs> So that's my, that's sort of my mini biography of my writing life. But, um, you know, we're here to talk about witches. So really, I'd just love to hear from you guys what you have to say or, you know, what you thought about it or what other books you're reading alongside it or anything you want to talk about. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. It'll be very awkward and boring. <laughs> Oh, come on, y'all wrote questions. So, like, Julie, yes, you might need to get closer to the speaker. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, you're going to have to get closer to the speaker. Yeah, I think so. Because you guys are like this big on my screen. Were you really considering like magic realism when you were writing this book? Or is that not really a genre you feel this book is a part of? Or, well, you know, thank you for that. Um, I love magic realism. Um, I grew up in the South and everything just kind of is magic realist. You know, it's like, I feel like it's a very haunted part of the country. You know, it's the only region in America that ever lost a war. It's a very blood soaked part of America, you know, with, you know, the enslavement of, um, you know, of Africans and the genocide of native peoples and, you know, it, and going through Jim Crow and everything else. And it's a very, um, it's a very haunted region. And so um, I think that uh, magic realism just felt like a very natural uh, place to be writing from. Um, just the, the past is always present. The ghosts are always with us. Um, people are very invested in their family stories and their very bloody family legacies. And so, um, and then I was really reading about, I was reading a lot of folklore when I wrote this book and the character of Cora, you know, who's a, who's a mountain witch. And I was, you know, I was thinking a lot about power and powerlessness and how people that are very poor um, find their power. And very often, if you don't have money or if you don't have real power, you you find it in the occult, you find it in magical thinking, you find it in, um, you know, t foretelling the future or the the ghost stories, the the vengeful ghost stories that you tell. And so, um, you know, I have this man Tucker who kind of comes across this woman, and and sort of almost projects onto her. So you never quite know, is she really a witch or is she Tucker's perception of a witch? Is she just a poor mountain woman, you know, who talks big or is, or is it the truth? And then does it become the truth once you start to believe it? Um, so I was reading a lot of Appalachian folklore at the time I was writing it. And that, that's a real legend from the, the Panther of Panther Gap, you know, and the, the person that's oh. thrown, and that's like, I don't know if you guys know your Greek mythology, but the um, Atlanta myth about the golden apple, 
you know, where she's in a, they're in a foot race and she throws a golden apple and turns people away so that she can run faster and she throws another golden apple. And it was really interesting to find the echo of that ancient Greek myth and the sort of like Appalachian folklore of, you know, of somebody being chased by a panther and stripping off their clothes and throwing them to try to distract the panther until they're completely naked by the time they arrive and then are devoured anyway. And that's sort of a little bit how I, I felt about fear, you know, and Cora, this, this folklorish witch who would take her skin off, she would ride men until, you know, it's very sexual and she would ride them until they collapsed with exhaustion. And, you know, I just was thinking about that in the 24 hour news cycle or now with social media where it's like shit coming at you 24 hours a day, keeping you afraid and you start to like lose your mind. And it's like, it, it's, it's a, it's a form of riding us until we're exhausted. And so that's what I was really looking at, you know, with the, the magic realist bent of the book. Um, what are you guys reading? What are the other books on your syllabus? You all remember? Do I have any problem? Can I go up and name a couple? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so a couple of we read, read um, The Kingdom of This World, um, 100 Years of Solitude, um, Beloved, 100 mm -hmm. Secret Senses, uh, Pentacle. These are great. Some of them I have not, I've heard of, but I have not read, but um, yeah. I mean, do you think, let me ask you guys a question. I mean, do you think that things feel more true or more real with the magic realism or like, how are you, how are you guys experiencing it? Does it get to a different kind of truth? You all are being graded on this. I was going to say. <laughs> you vary from over here, I'm on the side. Yeah. Well, um, I would say for me personally, throughout what, I, what we've read, um, the ghosts and the, the magic, quote unquote, is not something that's like, in your face or meant to be in your face yeah it's a part of the story as a whole and it it adds to messages that otherwise maybe we wouldn't see the importance behind or not focus on as much right right thank you and you know i i thought a lot about um you know ghost is trauma right like ghosts are manifestations of something that's unresolved or something that is traumatic and it was very funny, like, you know, I got a lot of really great reviews on my book, but then I would have people write into Goodreads or whatever. And they're like, I wanted there to be more real witches or more real ghosts. And I'm like, what is a real witch? And what is a real ghost? You know, it was very interesting the way that people use genre sometimes to, like, if you look at something like Beloved, you know, that's a very haunted book, but it's, it's literature as, you know, as like, you know, a discovery of witches, or I'm trying to think of like some of the books that are more kind of popular books where witches are kind of like, you know, more grounded with superpowers, you know, and it's, that's the, um, you know, we call both of them witches or we call all of them ghosts, but like what makes a real witch or a real ghost as opposed to, you know, a manifestation of trauma or something psychological, um, yeah, I think that's one of the the reasons I've always loved magic realism is it just blurs all those boundaries in the way that I, I feel like as we grow up, everything just becomes more and more blurred. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. So I actually just defended my thesis on magic realism today. So this, this conversation- Congratulations, that's great. Um, but part of the conversation was about how magic realism provides an avenue for stories to be told that would normally not be told if we were discussing solely from historical fact, um, especially in the US, like their narratives that would just kind of be like struck down. So I think in terms of like, especially if you talk about Appalachia, like in order to get some point across, you almost need magic realism to get it there um, so that it has a place. Thank you. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And look, you can write a really, you can write a really grim history of Appalachia and, you know, whatever, but I do think it just, um, it feels true to the culture, 
also. I think there are certain parts of the country that are more, you know, all right, this is a gross generalization, but I think there are certain parts of the culture that are more literal and others that are more mythical. And I do think that Appalachia and the South in, in our particular, you know, in the history of America are places that are kind of epic and, you know, and larger than life and ghosts and, you know, witches and everything like that sort of, you know, it, it's so funny. I've, I've talked about this in, an, in another context, but, you know, growing up in the South is kind of as close as I can, I can almost equate it to second generation Germans, like the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of the Holocaust and what the German people did. And you have inherited the legacy like you didn't participate in it but you have inherited the legacy of that and it's something that hangs over your consciousness and it, uh, and sometimes it is almost impossible to talk about that kind of darkness without using the metaphor of ghost of tra of you know of witchcraft of evil of of these sorts of things and i feel like in america a lot of the same you know, mass rape and, you know, mass enslavement and things. It's not, it's clearly not completely equivocal, equivocal, but it's, but it's the closest we come, I think, in this country. And so I think sometimes in the South, we've, we've evolved a language, those of us who are younger, like I, Faulkner seems to not be read anymore, but like, if people go back to Faulkner or they go back to Flannery O'Connor, or they go back to these people that were talking in terms of grotesqueries or, um, you know, really heightened language or kind of a stream of consciousness form of writing. To me, it's a grappling with what went down here in our great, great grandparents, you know, time. Um, and so I was trying to get at that a little bit through these three generations of a family, you know, how they're all speaking to one another and Eddie being exposed to this outside world and grappling with his own sexuality and then, you know, becoming kind of a figure of fun. Like when, when I grew up and Richard, I don't know if you had this when you were a kid, these like late night horror show hosts that would dress up as ghouls and show scary movies and it was kind of an indoctrination about like how do you how do you deal with fear in a comical sort of way um and so he was living in relationship to being like scared out of his wits by his own mother and then you know Wallace who grew up with this father who was lying about who he truly was under the mask of kind of comedy and horror grows up to wield her witchcraft in a very global sort of way um, so, you know, I, I was trying to do that intergenerational thing with fear. Yeah. Um, so let's see, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. That's I awesome. love you guys. It's like, I'm never sure where any of us are looking. <laughs> <laughs> or one of those games where someone's going to run. Right. Um, so, so last year I took a Native American literature course and we had Joy Harjo visit and that, like, I guess that was the first time it was really good I took that class before this because that was really listening to her and kind of realizing one of the great, it was so enriching to, to read books where ancestors, for instance, very important. And that's very much what you were just talking about. You're thinking about who came before you and, and in order to tell really, you know, really you know, very exciting and sort of really lively and alive stories about people who are no longer with us. I think that immediately is evocative of this sort of magic realism genre. And um, and so, and I just, I feel like you just kind of move into that world and then it seems so natural. But I think, I think a function of using it in books is really it's, it provides a very rich texture to the story you're telling, which is which is something without it, it's it's not exactly the same. It's not that it's not good too, but it's right, just, right. It's a really unique way. And so I just want well, to say- think, Oh, thank you. I, I mean, I think it keeps the past alive, right? It's like when you have these figures or you have ancestors in a book and there's a kind of immediacy to it that you realize none of us really can escape the past. You know, maybe we don't think about it all the time, but we're shaped by it, we're formed by it, we live in reaction to it, we're gonna fuck up our kids in the way that our parents fucked up us, you know, and going back and back and back. 
And it's like, it's all connected. And I think that, um, I think that magic realism is a way of blurring those boundaries that helps you feel that, you know, with that kind of immediacy. So yeah, yeah I completely agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so, so fantastic. Yeah. Down front. I see an arm. Yeah. <laughs> um, was there any inspiration for any of the characters in the book based off of like people you know in your real life or just morals that you possess that you want to put on a character or anything like that? Um, that that's a great question. Um, yes, I so the the character of Captain Casket, like Eddie, the horror show host, is based on what I grew up in Richmond, Virginia where I am right now. And at midnight, I used to stay up and watch something. It was called shock theater. And the character was named Bowman body. And he would wear like white ghost face. And he had a scar across his head and like was dressed as a ghoul. And he had these like dirty tennis shoes on. And he would just do really dumb jokes, you know, in the, you know, and, uh, and then show the horror film. And then like during the commercial break, more dumb jokes. And then when I was, maybe 13, like around the age that Wallace is in this, I'm going to tell you two ridiculous stories. So about the age that Wallace is in the book, two things happened. My parents who were in the middle of getting a divorce took in a boy from um, the boy's home where my mother worked, who was an orphan. He had no place to go on holidays. Both of his parents had died. He was Jasper's age. So he's like 15 and I was 13. And there was suddenly this strange boy in our house that I didn't really know what to do with. And it, and it was also like, they weren't really gonna adopt him, but they, it was it a was very, and he was, um, he was very, um, uh, he was a big risk taker. He used to make my sister and I like lie down in the driveway and he would build a ramp and he would like jump his bike like over us, you know? So I sort of, his name was Leon and, um, and terribly, he actually was in a terrible car wreck from driving his car too fast. Um, but he became sort of the inspiration for Jasper and Jasper as, as a boy who was, um, looking for a father figure, but who was also, um, a young gay child or, or grappling with his own sexuality. And then Eddie, who was married, but also in the 1970s grappling with his sexuality. And, it, and so this hero worship that Jasper had towards Eddie was really dangerous because you, it couldn't cross over sexually because that would be inappropriate, but they, they were both feeling things they couldn't really act on. And it was not even so much sexual as it was, uh, as it was sort of, um, like a, like a, like, like a hero worship in a way. And so it was, again, sort of like blurring the lines of that. So those two characters are based on people that I knew or I knew about. Um, and then I did a lot of research for Tucker and Sonia, the WPA people, based a little bit on, there were a lot of um, like male, female teams that were going out in the 1930s into the 1940s, you know, collecting folk stories. And Zora Neale Hurston was one down in Florida. Um, and, um, you know, they would go out and like take pictures, um, let us now praise famous men by Walker Evans and James Agee, which is fantastic if you guys have ever read that book. Um, but they were they were sort of collect they were they were sent out to explain America to itself during a time of great insecurity during the during the depression. And so I did a ton of research on WPA workers and ghost story and folklore collectors. And I created those people. And I was also in a relationship at that time with a man who was very much like Tucker. So I sort of like stole his life and put that in. And I'm just trying to think of, and then Wallace, I think was a little bit of an avatar for myself, you know, as just kind of a modern woman grappling with, a, you know, motherhood and, um, and then the, the last story I'll tell you because it's just so fucking weird. So when I was 13, again, like Wallace's age, my next door neighbor was obsessed with um, Sean Cassidy, who I don't know if you guys even rem even know who he is. He was a big pop star in the 70s. And now he became like a movie producer and everything else. But at that time, he was like a big pop star and she was obsessed with him. And I hated his guts. I just thought he was like such a simp. And so I went out into the woods one day when I was 13 years old and I took a rusty nail and I carved Sean Cassidy's face into a tree and I I 
drove that nail through his eyes. And the next day I read in the newspaper that he had been attacked by his fans at like a concert and they ripped out all of his hair. And I was like, oh, I've got too much power. And so I was like, I, I like swore off witchcraft, but here's the thing that's so weird about it. So 20 years later, 30 years later, I'm now writing for television, right? I've written this book, which is on the road tonight. Um, I adapted it into a, into a pilot and who should want to option it and be the showrunner on it, but Sean Cassidy himself. That's insane. I don't think so. <laughs> and I was like, do I, do I tell him the story or is he going to think I'm a sociopath? And so I, I ended up not telling him, but, but the character of Eddie of Captain Casket reminded him of his own father, who is this larger than life personality, uh, Jack Cassidy. But, and so he, he optioned it and was, you know, taking it out and trying to get it made and then nothing ever happened with it, but it was like, how bizarre is that? That I, you know, put a hex on him when I was 13. And then however many years later, he wanted to make that script into a, you know, cause, cause she does that to Jasper. She carves his face in a tree and then something bad happens to Jasper. But anyway. Hey, magic to get into this. <laughs> Did you say I couldn't hear you? Maybe you should have used that magic to get him to produce it. <laughs> I know, I know. He wasn't that great. So maybe it was all for the best. <laughs> Anybody else? Was that oh, a no. yes, yes. Um, I had another one. This is a kind of related to um question about like how you develop the story. Did you kind of have all after the first? narrative did you kind of have the other two set up in your mind as far as like what the story would be or did you kind of just base it off I'm writing these this story about fear and you know trauma and all this and you built it off of that right um I wish that I had it better planned it probably would have been easier to write but I um I'd written sort of like a big chunk of the Appalachian part and, you know, that original Frankenstein and I'd found it online and, you know, the it's it's really bizarre if you guys ever want to watch it. It was one of the first movies ever made and our first horror movies ever made. And um, I sort of had that planned out. And then I just had these two other like I had wanted to write something about a horror show host. And then um, and Wallace was sort of like more of a framing device, like her her telling the story is, you know, that one night that she spent when she was kind of stepping out on her marriage, like, you know, in this crazy part of Brooklyn that I had been to before, which is truly just junkyards. And then um, a friend of mine who was in Russia had told me a story that had happened to them when they were living in, um, they were living in Armenia. And that story that I, I tell of Wallace throwing the stake when she's being attacked by wild dogs and sort of like the, and then managing to get back to the hotel. That was a real story that somebody had told me. And so I had that story in my mind and I had the horror show host sort of thing in my mind. Um, and then I just, I don't even know how it all came together. I just, it's suddenly after I had gone to England and I listened to that person talking about, you know, fear and writing and, you know, how we had to overcome it. I'm like, you know what? I think these are all one story. And so then it was just kind of sitting down and it was really, um, some of my other books I've outlined, you know, like Dress Lodger, I really outlined it. I knew what was coming and what every chapter needed to be. When you're writing for television, you have to outline, you know, especially if you're writing anything that's plot driven, because if you're really not, if you really don't know all the reversals, you're just like floating in the middle of, in you're lost in space. But with this book, it was a little bit more of a, I was in a rough patch in my own life, you know, with these little children and my son being so sick and my marriage had blown up. And I was almost writing as a form of, um, like channeling something like I would just sit down and it would just boom, kind of come out. And then of course I had to go back and revise it all. But this one, this is more like a, a cry of a cry of desperation. It's a, it's, it's a dark book. It's probably by far the darkest book I've ever written. Um, 
and it, it came from a different place in my body than my other books had come from. So some of it was planned. Most of it was like vomited out. And then I went back and sort of sculpted it and carved it. Um, I'm, I'm actually, it's, I think it's maybe my favorite book like that and Dress Lodger, just because it's, you know, I, I was writing from a place of, of trying to conquer my own fear. And that's what the book is about. So it was sort of like my state of being and my subject matter were in conversation with one another, which is an interesting place to write. I do not recommend it, but it's an interesting place to write from. If that answers your question. Thank you. Are any of you guys? Are, oh, yeah, go ahead. If someone was like to only take one thing from like Witches on the Road tonight, what would you like want that one thing to be? That one thing to be. I would, I would ask myself, how have we become such a suicidal culture? It's like everything that we are doing is in the way that we perpetuate fear is, um, is either numbing people, freaking people out, re-traumatizing people that are already traumatized. Um, who stands to benefit from that? And what can we do to push back against it? I think that that is, you know, as I was writing it, I was thinking a lot about this. And look, I was writing this during the first Gulf War. Like I, I started it when we went into um, Iraq and they were looking for weapons of mass destruction. And that, and it was a lie. It was fear mongering. And it was a way of getting people on board to do something horrifying and we are still paying the price for going into Iraq. Everything that is you guys are dealing with right now on campus goes back to that original sin. So I I'm always wondering like if you're reading this book and you start it like ask yourself who stands to benefit by you being afraid or you and and what and and what we are feeding especially young people. Um you know, because it, it is a suicidal impulse in our culture. It is it is a kind of self-hatred to want to want to perpetuate fear and 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 keep people down because of it. So that would that would be my thing that I would hope all of you guys would take away from it. Or if you if you pass it off to somebody, you know, why why do we use fear as a form of social currency? Other questions? Come on, I know you have more. There was 40 questions. So. <laughs> I know. I was so impressed. Great. Is there anything you had to cut from the novel that you can put in? Or I had to cut? Um, this is the great thing about being a novelist as opposed to a TV writer. Like when I'm writing for TV or I'm writing a script, I'm just like carving. Oh, I'm cutting, 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 cutting. And, you know, I think with novels, they're very forgiving. So I definitely, you know, I definitely, whenever you're writing, you throw away hundreds of pages, you know, of just like blind alleys or, you know, just not very good prose. Um, but I I feel like, um, I feel like I got most everything in that, if anything, it probably could have standed, it could have benefited from a little bit more editing down. But, um, you know, there's so much historical, um, like ginseng stuff. Like I did so much research into ginseng and like ginseng wars and people would like, one day I'll write a TV show about it because, you know, people are killing each other over ginseng patches. And there was so much folklore I could have gone into with all that. You know, I really could have set an entire novel in that, in that 1940s Appalachian period. Um, you know, but it would have, it would have been a really different book. It would have been a straight up historical novel. And I just wasn't, I just kind of didn't want to do that again. Oh, gosh. All right. So I have a question about Sonia. Um, so I thought she was really interesting. And then she kind of like disappeared. And that that made me kind of sad actually. I was sort of hoping she would reappear, but then she reappeared right in the art in the art gallery, right? Which I thought right. was really, really cool. Like, um, and and you know, and you knew she was alive because there was a pen and books to sign. So I was like, oh, she's still alive. Still um, alive, yeah. Well, because you kind of tied up the loose ends with Tucker, you know, more or less, right? right. Left something to the imagination. But um, 
Yeah, I wondered, I wondered was like, was that something you thought of sort of, oh, maybe I'll have her reappear in the book or how did you, how did you decide to do that? Like, cause I found that to be really, that was like, oh, nice. You know, that's another little thing that was sort of. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because, you know, they're in the 1940s part and it was really like a woman kind of coming into her own, somebody who had always thought she would sort of be defined by men. And she was starting to realize that she was the stronger one in the relationship. Um, and I was sort of patterning her. I, I mean, I was going through some very similar things at the time. So she was a little bit of an app, like she and Wallace are probably, I mean, everything that you write is a crypto autobiography. There's a little, you could only write about people if you've experienced, or at least had the thought of the things that they're thinking about, even if you haven't acted on it, hopefully not. But, um, you know, I, I felt like Sonia was probably the character that in a weird way I liked the most. And she and Wallace have a lot in common, I think. And, you know, she was a, like a war correspondent and a war journalist and like Margaret Bork White and these women that were sort of like photojournalist of that period. Um, I sort of and 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 also like James Agee again, or I'm sorry, Walker Evans in that let us now praise famous men, you know, and his his way of uh, photographing people. And then, you know, I wanted also to tie up, um, you know, Eddie's wife and Wallace's mom, you know, as a woman who was really trying to do her best and fell in love with somebody who was gay and then had to live with the ramifications of, you know, what that meant for her as she was slowly starting to understand it. Um, so it was really kind of just sort of putting everybody in, you um, you know, I think as as I've grown as a writer, part of what you learn is what not to say. You know, before when you're writing, when you're a young writer, it's like you're just you're trying to figure everything out. So you say everything that you can possibly say. And then later, as you just have more life experience and you've said so much already, you learn more what you can leave out. I can't remember who actually it was maybe Nadine Gordimer or some some brilliant female writer was talking about that. Like that you you just learn to trust the silence or trust the gaps so that you as the reader can kind of fill in, you know, what Sonia must have been up to. And here she is now in a museum. So um, it's sort of like allowing other people to sort of not not have to tell people everything and allow them to sort of fill in. Give them a little signpost along the way. I have um, one more. Um, when writing, like, which is on the road tonight or any other book, do you write it with the intent of, like, conveying a message? Or are you just writing, like you were saying, it's almost like a therapeutic experience for you because you're going through a tough time in your life? Do you, right. you like, kind of get that one message through or maybe a couple messages? Or is it just kind of, if they get it, they get it. If they don't, it's it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I think bad writing like bangs you over the head with a message. I think most writers, like you wouldn't put yourself through writing 400 pages if you weren't trying to say something. Um, you know, when I was writing Dress Lodger, which is a lot about, um, it's about the working poor and the way, I tend to write a lot about like um, power power dynamics, especially between class and the, in, in which is, I mean, on in Dress Lodger, it was the uses that the rich put the poor, like the poor couldn't stop working even after death because it was about anatomy studies and how the poor were um, given over to anatomy teachers if they died in the poor house. It used to be if you were a convicted killer and you were hanged by the state as like an extra punishment, they would give your body to medical students to dissect. But then in 1832, with the stroke of a pen, they passed the Anatomy Act and it and it said, if you died poor, you could be given to anatomy students to dissect. So it was like the poor were never allowed to rest even in death. And so I want, that was sort of thematically what I was getting at in that. And then of course, call, it was also about the cholera epidemics and the, um, guys, I'm going to put you on mute in just a minute because my mother is coming down in her stair lift and it's going to get really loud. <laughs> I'm in Virginia. I'm going to put you on mute. Hold for two seconds. I don't know. Maybe can you hear that over the. No. Okay, good. Then I'll keep talking. <laughs> it's like.
<laughs> She's coming down the stairs on her little chair lift. So it's like a, um, oh. but, um, uh, so I do think that you do sort of think thematically kind of in a, in a broad way, you know, like I said, I, I was with witches. It was like, how do we use fear as currency in our society? How does one generation live in reaction to the one that came before it? How is witchcraft, how is witchcraft passed down and what form does it take? And so those were all things that I was kind of thinking about in the back of my head, but I wasn't sitting there like, all right, this paragraph must convey that message. You really do hope that you you kind of have to think about it and then forget it and hope and trust that it comes through in that way. And then again, in TV, it's much more pointed, like every, because everything is dialogue and it's so spare, like television in a weird way is more like poetry in that, you know, every sentence matters, everything, there's nothing wasted in a, in a television script because you tell an entire story in 60 pages and only through dialogue. So it's a very you know, you have to have the entire idea in your head and then you have to strip everything away and just put the, put the dialogue in. So it's a, it's a really different way of, of writing. I feel like novels are in some ways they're harder in some ways they're a lot more forgiving. And are any of you guys writers that are in the, that are taking these literature classes? Are you, are you inspired to write? Yes. <laughs> It's a great profession. I mean, look, you're never going to make, you won't make a lot of money, but it's, you have an enormous amount of freedom. Last questions for Sherry. So uh, I was wondering what kind of um, historical or folklore research you're going to do for writing this. And if you think that's like a forgotten history and if we should like teach it more. I, I do. And I think that, um, I love folklore. I love like if you if I'm sure probably um, your college has some, but um, their WPA like their collections of WPA um, ghost stories and folk tales and um, their recordings of um, uh, the last in, uh, formerly enslaved people who were still alive in the 1930s and their their audio recordings of people who were born into slavery and who lived through all of that. And, you know, if, and, and people went out and collected these stories, they collected um, that uh, the little children's game that the title comes from, which is on the road tonight. That was a, that is something I found in a book of folklore from the, from the area, from the period. So I feel like um, folklore is like, it's such a, as a historical novelist, like you have to be so careful because you can put too much fact in and then it just feels like a slog, like you're being read a history lesson. But I think that it also is so inspirational. Like when I was writing Dress Lodger, I went to England, I went to Sunderland where the book takes place to do research over there. And I found these, um, they were in the local library, like a whole list of, of, um, and this is from 1828, like all the businesses that were on every street and who owned them and the names and the names of, there was a, a pub called the labor in vain. And that sort of became the thematic like touchstone of the entire book that we labor in vain. And it was, and it was a real place and that inspired me. And I feel like so much of what I got for Witches on the Road tonight, I found through the woman taking her skin off and riding men into exhaustion and things like that. So I would say if any of you are interested, like folklore is just, it's just it's the best way to learn history, I think, because it's so personal and so human and so weird, like just so many bonkers little things. And then, you know, it's like, talk to the people around you or talk to the, the older people in your life before they're gone, just to you know, because I mean, now, come on, everything is filmed and it's it's so different. But, you know, back then, that was the only touchstone we sort of had to the past. This light keeps going on and off. It's like, I feel like there's a ghost in the room. <laughs> this lamp is like flickering on and off. I was like, Ooh, what's going on? Hi, um, do you have any plans to write any new books in the future? Or are you just going to stick to TV? Oh, thank you. I would love to, okay, here's, you can tell me whether you guys would read this book. 
Um, so I've got it. I've got two more TV projects lined up. So I'm going to be doing that. And that's how I get my health insurance. And that's how I make my money. But when I was 10 years old, I lived like way out in the country and I lived on a graded road that became a dirt road. And a, I, and one of my earliest memories is this body, this naked man's body floated up in the swamp down the road from my house. And on this last trip here, uh, you know, like two days ago, I finally found out who that man was. I found out who killed him. I found out that person is still alive. I found out the secret society that these people were involved in of people who had been in a mental institution that then came out and started this society called the um, Red, the um, uh, Scarlet Letter Society. And there's like a like a, a gay subplot and it's all happened for real down the street from where I grew up. So I'm thinking about turning that into a book. Would anybody read that? Um, I would absolutely read that. I am so right? Please let me know to write that and publish it. I want to read it right away. I know. It's like now that's all I want to write. It's like because I'm doing all the research on it and I'm like the Scarlet Letter Society. I mean, like you cannot make that up. So I think that this is going to be my next book. So you guys heard it. You are the first people I've told <laughs> besides my mom, who is like driving me around. And the, the the night of the murder, they'd gone out supposedly to this guy's farm to steal tomatoes, but it was really like some crazy, I don't know. And then they left his body in the swamp and it has haunted me for my entire life. Who was that person? And I finally found out. So Thank you. Thank you, Google and newspapers.com. I was able to like, like go into the archives and find a bunch of stuff that had never been published before. So, so hopefully I will write that book, but it's probably going to be a couple of years because I got to, I've got three kids in college. I have to pay it off first. And then I'll... <laughs> Anybody else? I feel like a dead body in a swamp is a good note to go out on, right? <laughs> <laughs> No questions? No? Well, um, Sherry, it's, it's lovely to see you, uh, virtually at least. Um, Great to see you. Guys, thank you for reading my book. I really appreciate it. Thanks for assigning it, Richard. Always. I love reading this book. So thank you. And, uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks, guys. And Richard, hopefully I'll see you in June. Yes. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.